I think we'll 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 get going. Welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the twelfth webinar in this discussion series on 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 climate tipping points, exploring uh, tipping elements, uh, notions of irreversibility, and the abrupt changes in the uh, systems that uh, that we uh, that we need to pay a bit more attention to. My name is Tallulah Oni, I'm a Clinical Director of Research at the University of Cambridge, and I will be your moderator for the next hour and a half. Uh, the, the broader goal, just to introduce for those who have not been part of the discussion series so far, the broader goal of this of series is to advance knowledge on those tipping, tipping elements so that we can uh, develop a research agenda collectively, understanding how to better treat those tipping elements in the, in the scientific community, but also to, to jointly design experiments um, to tackle um, this existential uh, critical issue. Uh, <clears throat> the networks behind the series are the Earth Commission, there's a global team of scientists uh, working on uh, a safe and just corridor for people and planet, uh, the analysis, integration and modeling of the Earth System Project, which is a global research network uh, composed of Earth, Earth System scientists and scholars. Um, both the AIMS and the Earth Commission are hosted by Future Earth, uh, <clears throat> a global network of scientists, researchers and innovators collaborating for a more sustainable planet. And lastly, the Safe Landing, landing Climate uh, light, Lighthouse activity of the World Climate Research Programme. Uh, this event is co-organized by the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter. Okay, so this is the 12th uh, <clears throat> uh, seminar on this discussion series. Previous ones have explored different aspects of the, of the tipping points from the Amazon, permafrost, ice sheets, monsoons, that intersection between human and earth systems into linkages, etc. And I can refer you to the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, host website for more details. But today we are focused on the health implications of the climate tipping points. And we're honored to have two incredible speakers uh, with us who will present and then we will have an opportunity, everyone on this call will have an opportunity to pose questions um, in, uh, in an interactive Q&A um, afterwards. Feel free as we go along to post your, post your questions in the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your screen there, there's a Q&A function. Please add your questions to that. And for everyone, whether or not you're adding questions, you can also upvote um, particular questions that may, have, that may have come up. And we will get to these um, as, we go, as we go along, either a little bit after the discussion or um, after the presentations or towards the end. So just do log your questions as we go. Um, and then the last thing to note is that we this has been recorded and the recording will be on the Tipping Point series confetti web page so it will be accessible for you in the future and the link to the recording will be posted in the chat in due course. Okay, how are we going? Great, we are ticking. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Christy Eddy. Uh, Chris is a professor in the Center for Health and the Global Environment. She's been conducting research and practice on the health risks of climate variability and change for over 25 years, focused on uh, understanding the sources of vulnerability, uh, the current and future health risks to climate, of climate change, and uh, designing adaptation policies and measures to reduce risks in, um, in different environments. And also critically looking at health co-benefits of, of uh, different mitigation policies. Uh, Chris has supported countries in different regions across the world in assessing their vulnerabilities and in, and in um, implementing adapt, uh, adaptation uh, programs and has been an author on multiple um, national and global uh, climate change assessments, including um, the uh, IPCC6 assessment report. Uh, Chris, you'll be talking to us today a little bit on those um, uh, uh, health impacts and, and, and risks that we face. And so it's a pleasure to hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and I really appreciate the interest. I'm going to start by stepping back and talking a little bit about what are health systems. When people think about health systems, they often think that that means our infrastructure, our healthcare facilities. In fact, that's only part of a health system. 
in some countries, the health care and public health, which is the other major component of a health system, are all under the Ministry of Health. In other countries, they're separate. And in thinking from the perspective of tipping points, we need to think about how our health systems are supporting human health and well being. So the health system includes not just the infrastructure, but also the institutions. The figure on the left is from the World Health Organization. It shows the basic building blocks in the middle of a health system leadership and governance, health workforce, health information systems and on around the circle. The outer part of the circle are the components of a climate resilient health system. So you can see there's more components in health information systems and in service delivery to ensure that we transition our health systems into something that is climate resilient and environmentally sustainable. Underlying all of that, of course, are the people. And so when we think about health systems, we have to think not just about the institutions, about our infrastructure, but about the people who are involved in all of that. Both the people that can make things happen and the people who work, for example, in healthcare facilities who are impacted when we see extreme weather and climate events. In thinking about this presentation, I realized that healthcare is arguably the oldest profession in that people have been caring for each other from time immemorial. And when we think about health systems, their effectiveness, their weaknesses, there's been major advances over the last century in terms of life expectancy, survival of children past the age of five. There's lots to celebrate about how effective our health systems have been into getting us to the place we are today in terms of overall population health. We, of course, have also had areas where there's been major failures. COVID-19 is a mixed message. When you look at the number of people reported to have died from COVID-19 worldwide, it's about 6.6 .6 million. But when you try and estimate the total number of excess deaths, the number of people who died during COVID-19 over and above what you would have expected without a pandemic, the number is more around 20 million, perhaps as high as 23 or 26 million people. So clearly major failure from that perspective, but at the same time, millions and millions of lives were saved. And so thinking about the challenges of climate change and what it means for health systems, I think it's also critically important that we consider governance. There is a multi-country, multi-million dollar effort to look at global health security risks, specifically developing the Global Health Security Index, which is an index of something like 100 plus indicators looking at our, how our health systems function. And this Global Health Security Index illustrates the next point I would like to make is a critical importance of governance. The first index was published in November 2019, just a couple of months before COVID-19. Here's the score for the United States. You can see the indicators looked at the ability to prevent, detect, respond, the health system, the norms, and the risks. And going through all of these indicators, this massive effort concluded that the United States was best placed to handle a pandemic, concluded that the UK was second best able to handle a pandemic. Obviously, that was not borne out by reality, which means we need to think about governance. We need to look beyond the health system because all of the efforts have focused within the health system, but it matters, it turns out, who's president or who's prime minister. It matters how governance works or does not work within a country. And so again, tipping points will, will or will not occur based on a range of factors, some of which are far outside the control of the health system itself. 
Specifically, when we look in health, I'll start with a framing from the IPCC. I hope you're all familiar with the propeller diagram. When we look to the future, we're looking at risks. Risks are inherently uncertain. They are the combination of probability times consequence. Risk is composed of three major factors. The first, the hazards created by changing climate. The second is who or what is exposed to those hazards. Exposure varies significantly around the world. And that depends on quite a wide range of factors, not just location, but also economic factors, demographic factors. And the third is vulnerability, where vulnerability in health includes both susceptibility to be harmed, as well as the capacity of our health systems to manage. As I said, health systems have done a remarkable job over the years reducing cardiovascular disease deaths, reducing the number of deaths from cancer. When I was growing up, childhood leukemia was a death sentence, and it's not anymore. There's been so many advances that have been made, and so much further we have to go in the context of a changing climate. The figure on the right is one of many similar kinds of figures. It's one that Andy and I put together a couple of years ago. Across the top are some of the things that are changing, higher concentrations of carbon dioxide, leading to rising temperatures, et cetera, interacting then with a broad range of demographic, socioeconomic, environmental, and other factors that influence the magnitude and the pattern of risks. Together, these affect exposure pathways we typically look at in health extreme weather events on the right, social factors on the left. Underneath is a short list, and I mean a very short list of examples of climate sensitive health outcomes. There are hundreds of possible vector-borne diseases that could be affected by a change in climate. Health has been around for a long time. There's deep understanding of exposure and resilience and how they vary across populations and communities. So thinking about tipping points, we are starting from a different place than other sectors in that we have broad brush understanding of the risks, significant underinvestment in understanding those risks, but some progress has been made. And deep understanding of the particular populations and communities that are at higher risk and what can be done to help protect them. Of course, as we do more research, we have better understanding of the groups that are particularly at risk and better understanding of the most effective approaches to protect them. Thinking about the observed impacts, I know you're not supposed to put up slides with so many words, but this is a short summary of the IPCC human health chapter that was published earlier this year. You can see the headline statement, climate change is already adversely affecting the physical health of people globally and the mental health of people where data are available. There are more detection and attribution studies in health, so we can say now with very high confidence that people are dying from climate change. In light blue, you see the major categories of what was assessed in the chapter, extreme heat, vector-borne diseases, zoonotic diseases, water and foodborne, mental health, cardiovascular respiratory distress. The bottom bullet goes back to a point I made at the beginning that I won't really talk with, talk about much in the rest of the presentation, is that health services worldwide are already being severely disrupted by extreme events, particularly by flooding. And so we, we're seeing places such as in the Pacific Islands, where our healthcare facilities are on coastal areas. They're affected by storm surge, by king tides, by typhoons, severely disrupting access to healthcare services. A recent detection attribution study was a modeling study based on data from over 700 locations in 43 countries that connected with the MIP, the Mer Modeling Intercomparison Program that looked at detection attribution from the climate side. Over the last several decades, the proportion of heat-related mortality attributable to anthropogenic climate change in these 43 countries is about 37%. You can see wide variability across the countries that were covered. 
you can see just one country in Africa, which does not represent the rest of Africa particularly well, but shows you already we're seeing thousands, tens of thousands of people dying from climate change every year just from heat. And this is before doing detection attribution in other climate sensitive areas and is an important place to start in the discussion about moving policy on addressing the challenges we're already facing. There's lots of opportunities to address the challenges of heat. These are ideas for different approaches at the individual level and at the level of buildings and urban scales. And none of these includes air conditioning. It's important to understand there's lots that can be done in many places in the world, not all of them, but in many places of the world to reduce risks when temperatures rise and can be done relatively simply, as you see on the left, of having access to electric fan, having a, a spray bottle where you can put water on your skin, sit in front of that fan and have that evaporation cool you down, putting on damp clothing, there's evaporative coolers, and on and on. There's lots that needs to be done at the urban scale to make sure that as temperatures continue to rise, our cities are going to be comfortable and thinking about different ways to increase the natural ventilation in buildings, thinking about new construction materials, et cetera. One of the better heat action plans in the world is for England. It's been around for quite a few years and it's been very effective in lowering mortality from heat waves. However, you can see the challenges we're facing with climate change on the right from this last June to August. Just in the period of the 10th to the 25th of July, there was more than 2000 excess deaths. The death rates were 10% above average. So even in places that have worked hard to prepare, they're not prepared enough for the very extreme extremes we're experiencing. The projected risks are a little bit shorter because of significant underinvestment in research in this area. And I mean significant underinvestment. When one looks at the adaptation funding, for example, under the US National Institutes of Health, it's been running about 0.02% of their budget for more than a decade. The numbers are starting to increase with interest from Wellcome Trust with some funding from the EU, but it's really significant underinvestment. And so when people ask about projected impacts from a changing climate for health, there's little that we can say. About two thirds of the research has been on heat waves of the rest a significant proportion for dengue and for malaria. You can see the summary here. There's a lot more information that's gonna be coming out as investment increases in this area. An example on the heat related mortality from the United States makes some important points when we think about tipping elements going back to my comment about health systems. These are projected annual deaths in the end of the century under different assumptions of adaptation and of greenhouse gas emissions. You can see at the top left with no adaptation, high emissions, the death rate increases the deaths, the number of deaths, not the death rate, the, the number of deaths increases by almost 100,000. But in the bottom right, where there is adaptation and where there's lower emissions. The emissions are at 2.6 uh, watts per meter squared in 2100. You can see that there is a somewhat of an increase in the numbers of deaths, but not that significant. Obviously huge differences between these two worlds, pointing out the importance of both adaptation and mitigation and the importance of considering our health systems when thinking about tipping points. Because if we don't do anything to adapt, we don't do anything to mitigate, we're definitely gonna be in a world that's gonna be very challenging to live in. High morbidity, high mortality, significant problems for our health systems to be able to manage, impacts on worker productivity, 
lots of consequences. So tipping elements are gonna depend on what happens with adaptation and mitigation. I assume you're all familiar with the projection on the left under different scenarios from working group one of greenhouse gas emissions, how those could change across the century and the projected temperature change in 2100. That pairs with iconic figures that have been used for more than two decades in the IPCC to synthesize what's known about risks. I've just shown here heat-related morbidity and mortality. What we did in the health sector is a little bit different than what's been done in other sectors. If you're not familiar with the burning embers, the zero line are pre-industrial temperatures, the y-axis increase in temperature above pre-industrial. For each of the embers, each of the bars, the white area is where it's not possible to tell if there's been a change in heat-related morbidity and mortality. It could have changed, but we don't have enough long, we don't have long enough or sufficient data, or could not have changed. We just can't tell scientifically. When the color changes to yellow or to gold, it means in fact that heat-related morbidity and mortality has changed over time. And at least some of that change is due to climate change. So once we hit yellow, we are seeing anthropogenic impacts on our health and well-being. Color turns to red, the risks are high, purple, very high. The dots are the level of confidence in the transitions. The program we use to generate these generates those dots. I'd like to make them smaller, but I don't get the chance to. The gray bar on this figure is current increases in global mean surface temperature above pre-industrial. And you can see that we've got three sets of embers. One is a world in which there's high challenges to adaptation and to mitigation, basically SSP3. The middle is where there is incomplete adaptation. We continue to muddle through along our current trends. That scenario is capped at the projection in 2100 from the comparable scenario used in working group one. That of course is SSP2. And then the bar at the right is a world aiming to sustainable development, low challenges to adaptation, low challenges to mitigation. Under that scenario, the projections from working group one are that global mean surface temperature would not go above two degrees. So that's why you see the capping of those two. And just as the previous slide I showed, you can see the strong interaction of adaptation and mitigation. If we both adapt and we mitigate, our risks for heat-related mortality will certainly rise but nothing like a four degree world, which in many places will become unlivable. We did these embers for heat, ozone, malaria, and a variety of diseases carried by 80s mosquitoes. In the US, it's 80s aegypti. In Europe, it's 80s albopictus. And it's a mix of these in other places in the world. And in fact, other species of 80s mosquitoes. And so you can see that if we don't mitigate and if we don't adapt, that we're looking at very high risks across all of these as we get towards the end of the century. Thinking specifically about tipping points, one of the nightmare scenarios in the health sector is not dengue, which is the most common viral borne mosquito disease, about 400 million cases per year, but another virus that can be carried by the same mosquitoes, yellow fever. Yellow fever has a mortality rate of about 30%. There's a, a very effective vaccine that can prevent getting yellow fever if one's exposed to it, but not that many people are vaccinated. The vaccine requires a cold chain. It has to be cold from the moment it's manufactured to the moment it's injected, like the vaccines we're using in some places for COVID-19. And there's only a few hundred million vaccine doses available in the world for yellow fever. If yellow fever broke out in an urban area, for example, in Brazil, that has very high rates of dengue fever, it would be almost impossible to control. 
I can get anywhere in the world in 36 hours. People can actively carry yellow fever in their bodies to other places. This mosquito is widespread. It's spreading its geographic range because of climate change. And this could easily become a worldwide emergency on the same order of magnitude, if not larger than COVID-19. So we do have areas where tipping points are possible if we don't invest in our health systems and make sure we've got the governance in place that we need. Uh, just like with heat though, for vector-borne diseases, there's lots of opportunities for developing early warning systems. The health sector is starting to take advantage of the significant environmental information available to develop early warning systems for dengue and for other vector-borne diseases. So our health systems could in fact be quite effective I'm not sure they'd be effective enough if yellow fever broke out worldwide. And I focused on health. These are the burning embers from the IPCC special report on warming of 1.5 degrees, showing the range of embers that we produced in that report. And it makes, for me, the important point, we have to look beyond just the health systems. We have to look beyond population health and well being. If you look, for example, just at the left warm water corals, the report concluded that at 1.5 degrees, 75 to 90% of warm water corals would be gone. At two degrees, they all could be gone. But we didn't have the information to connect that with food security. Losing the warm water corals would condemn hundreds of millions of people to food insecurity because they wouldn't have the fish that they normally eat. Similar comments on small scale, low latitude fisheries, look at the coastal flooding and think about the impacts we've seen in, it's not coastal flooding, but the flooding we've seen in Pakistan and the devastating consequences for being unprepared for extreme events and what that means for human health and well being. So, it's hard to know what could happen with tipping points, but as always, the lack of knowledge is an urgent call to action. It's not a call for complacency. There's possibilities we could cross tipping points in health, and I look very much forward to what Andy has to say about this. And we have to invest in our health systems so that we're much better prepared to face a very different future than what we're in today. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, um, Chris, for that really um, spot on um, intro to this really critical topic. I just had one quick um, reaction to your to your um, to your presentation, which is data and the importance of of data in different parts of the world because a couple of the graphics that you showed is really striking well the impacts are really striking but sometimes the absence of data is really striking so could you maybe comment on how on what role that plays and in in your thinking around um around these these vulnerabilities that's a great question thank you for that i have a couple of different responses is yes we definitely need the data and we can't wait. And so at the same time that we invest in the data, I have been continually impressed in the work I've done with ministries of health of the incredible knowledge that is in healthcare workers. I can sit down in a least developed country with somebody in the ministry of health concerned about dengue and say, temperatures are gonna go up, precip is gonna be more variable, what would happen? They instantly have an answer. They've been working on this issue for so long. They have insights into where the challenges are going to arise, what they're going to have to do. And so we do have to take advantage of the very deep knowledge. Officially, we've been around as a field for more than 150 years. And so to use that knowledge while we are simultaneously collecting the data that we need and use the mm -hmm. knowledge to inform us of where it's critical that we collect data first. Mm -hmm. I guess highlighting the importance of different types of knowledge, right? Because we're often very narrow in what we say is data, but actually what you're describing is, an, is a form of data that's very helpful. Um, 
Thank you very much for that. I see a, a question there on, on COVID, which I will actually come back to if we just hold on to that um, after, um, after Andy's talk, because I think that might be something um, that uh, we, could, we could touch on in Andy's talk. And just again, a reminder to everyone to please post your questions that you may have in the Q&A um, text box. So you can find the Q&A button at the, the bottom of your screen there. So do post the questions as you, as, you, um, as you think of them. So thank you very much, Chris. Do please stay with us. We'll have a chance to, to have uh, questions with you uh, at the end. Now it's my pleasure to in introduce uh, Sir Andy, Andy Hayne. Andy is a Professor of Environmental Change and Public Health uh, with a joint, joint appointment in the Department of Public Health, Environment and Society and Department of Population Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In recent years, uh, Andy's focus of uh, research has been on the effects of environmental change on health and the impacts of policies to adapt uh, to or mitigate these changes. Um, he was a member of the working group two on the UN um, the IPCC for both the second and third assessment reports um, and is um, co-chair of the Lancet Pathfinders Commission on Pathways to a Healthy Zero Carbon Future and most recently uh, was awarded the rather prestigious 2022 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. Andy, it's a pleasure to have you here and to talk us through the the what we can do, so potential for action and um, in, in when considering these tipping points for health. Over to you. Uh, well, many thanks, Suda, for the introduction. Uh, what I'm going to do then is to build on what Chris has said about some of the tipping points uh, for, for health in the, in the climate change agenda. But also, as you've intimated, I'm going to focus uh, in the second part of my presentation on how knowledge, better knowledge of the healthcare benefits of climate action can also help to reinforce progress towards social tipping points. So firstly, what about uh, building on what Chris has said? I want to just say a few words about the health implications of, of reaching climate tipping points, as shown in this slide, would be familiar to many of you. Um, the, but also, of course, there are tipping points for health from climate trends, as, we, as we've heard from Chris. And I'm also going to make the point that there are potentially health tipping points from interactions between climate and other environmental changes. So very briefly, this is an area which there's really a lot of emerging interest in right now. And that is the potential for what we might call nasty surprises. So as we melt the permafrost, there is the concern that microorganisms, viruses, perhaps pollutants as well, uh, can emerge from the permafrost and infect human populations. And we know that there are many viruses that have developed um, adaptations or microorganisms that have, have developed adaptations that enable them to survive in the permafrost for many decades, perhaps um, uh, hundreds of years. And we don't know exactly what the health effects of releasing them might be, but there's sufficient evidence that we have to make us concerned. So there's Clostridium bacteria, smallpox viruses, mercury, which is an important pollutant, nuclear waste, atmospheric chemicals, which are in, trapped in, in the permafrost. So this combination could prove uh, an important tipping point for human health. And there's increasing uh, information and evidence about that with a lot more emphasis on trying to understand the implications of um, this particular tipping point for human health. Another example would be um, what happens as we deforest and burn the Amazon and how that, as we know, is one of the, the climate tipping points, the collapse, potential collapse uh, of the Amazon ecosystem and the fact that it could be transformed from a, and is being transformed from a, a carbon a sink to a source of carbon. And this slide just summarizes um, the results of a, a paper last year, which looked at the health impacts of wildfire smoke. From, largely from the Amazon in Brazil. And what you can see at the bottom is a map of Brazil with the maximum wildfire related PM 2.5 levels. You can see that the fine particles spread right the way down to the south of Brazil. And there's a good, a strong relationship between hospital admissions, both um, particularly uh, res respiratory hospital admissions shown on the red, but also cardiovascular hospital admissions as well. And you can see that uh, this is particularly important in the South, rather counterintuitively. And that's because the smoke spreads a long way, but also because the, the population in the South, more older people there, and they're more likely to suffer from some of the diseases of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases that uh, trigger some of these hospital admissions. 
So that just gives you one example, another example of how uh, exceeding these tipping points is accompanied by, by health impacts. Another one might be as, as the um, West Antarctic ice sheet melts, of course, sea level uh, rises. We're already seeing impacts of sea level rise on the health of populations around the world. Obviously, there's the impact of flooding, but th there's also impacts of increasing uh, salination, increasing effects of salt water ingress into fresh water. And this is a study some years ago from my colleagues, led by my colleagues Aniri Khan and Pauline Shieldbeek um, in coastal Bangladesh. And they found an unusually high incidence of preeclampsia in coastal pregnant women, a significant association with the level of sodium in drinking water and a significant reduction in blood pressure when changing from very saline drinking water to low saline rainwater based alternatives. The odds of high blood pressure were lower um, as the, uh, the concentration in drinking water uh, decreased as it does cyclically over time. So this is just another example of how rising sea levels can affect human health um, over and above the obvious effects of um, displacement of populations. But this, this slide takes us into another domain, which is what evidence do we have that we're approaching um, the tipping points for health from gradual increases in temperature? And this is taken from some data which is currently unpublished, but hopefully will be very published very soon. It's a relatively small study, but I think it's an important one. It was undertaken by my colleague Anna Bonnell and her colleagues based in the Gambia. And what they did was to measure extreme heat exposure in pregnant women subsistence farmers. Um, and they documented extraordinarily high levels of heat exposure already in these women subsistence farmers. This is the wet bowl globe temperature. You can see them measuring it literally in the field there. And that measures, it's a, a, a way of looking at <coughs> the heat stress and it in, integrates the uh, air temperature, the hu humidity, and of course, solar radiation as well. And you can see extraordinarily high levels of heat exposure already. And we believe that they're very close to uh, the edge of tolerance. In fact, this work also documents the fact that it's having an effect on the fetus already, uh, that there's an increased likelihood of very high fetal heart rates at the end of the kind of working shift, if you like. So these women don't have a choice. They have to go out into the fields to, in order to feed their family. And we believe that they're very close to a climate uh, tipping point and even you know, one or two degrees more could, could push them over with potentially um, catastrophic effects on their earning capacity. And some work we did a few years ago, a modeling study um, looking at the effects on, uh, of heat stress, increasing heat stress on labor productivity and what that might mean for people's livelihoods, showed that as we move um, to the second part of the century, as we move forward, an increasing, increasing number of people are exposed to extreme heat and indeed, we already have evidence that the capacity to work is being reduced by climate change, and that is pushing more people back into poverty. By the time you reach perhaps over two, just over two degrees, could be a billion people exposed to such high levels of heat that it's unsafe to work in the hottest months um, of the year. And that also uh, suggests that parts of the, the world may become uninhabitable. Um, as we move towards the latter part of, of the century, depending on the decisions uh, that we make. So these are populations that have the lowest adaptive capacity in many cases, it's not easy to see how some of these populations could adapt. But as you can see from the map, the area which is covered by its extreme heat exposure expands as the global average temperature uh, increase and covers substantial proportions of Latin America, uh, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa as we move forward. Oops, sorry. So uh, what, what about interactions with other environmental factors? Well, this uh, slide has taken some from, from some work that um, we colleagues were involved with a few years ago, looking at the effects of climate change, potential climate change um, and fresh water uh, vulnerability in parts of India. And as you may know, parts of India are already suffering from freshwater depletion. So they depend very much on finite aquifers, which are being depleted uh, at an unsustainable rate and can't be replenished um, over decadal or perhaps even century life, lifetimes. And you can see that there are multiple stressors on the freshwater system of which climate change is but one. There's population growth, there's dietary change towards uh, diets that require more fresh water, higher consumption of animal products, 
and as I've mentioned, groundwater depletion. And even though um, the Indian food system is responsible for lower greenhouse gas emissions, shown at the bottom of this slide, compared, say, with, with Europe, um, you can see that it requires a higher blue water footprint. So it requires more groundwater to feed, the, to, to supply uh, the food system. So this just shows us how climate change can interact with other environmental stresses, particularly in those parts of the world which have uh, finite uh, fresh water supplies like northern India, as shown in the slide. And we're also seeing, of course, the melting of glaciers as well to compound the problems. And this means that there will be complex tipping points uh, around the food system. And then Chris mentioned the importance of mental health, and we still haven't got good quantitative estimates of the mental health impacts. We do know that there's a high um, prevalence of mental health following extreme event exposures, floods, droughts, and so on, wildfires as well. Um, and we know that the mental health effects also combat, uh, com sorry, they uh, complicate uh, emergence from or adaptation to extreme um, events. And on the right side of this slide, you can also see how climate anxiety is becoming a pervasive issue. And if you look at the results of this, it's from a paper last year in Lancet Planetary Health, you can see that children and young people are experiencing very high levels of climate anxiety. And if you look at the tabulations here, you can see that high proportions of young people in all countries of the world are very or extremely worried about climate change. Um, and in some countries, it's much more than 50%, countries like India, for example, and the Philippines. So this does suggest that we're also, this. Um, these very high levels of climate anxiety may also suggest that we're approaching a tipping point for, for climate action, particularly amongst the young. And it also makes the point in this paper that many young people are losing faith in governments to take the necessary action. So this takes me to the, uh, the concluding part of my talk, which is about the social tipping points and how knowledge of the health benefits of climate action and the threats, of course, to climate change, uh, from climate change to human health, can motivate rapid climate action. And in the in the chat, I think you'll see Martin Herman is advertising a seminar that they're doing tomorrow night, a webinar, which will actually you can hear from a real expert in social tipping points, Ilona um, Otto, who wrote this excellent paper in PNAS in 2020, which I found quite influential. And she made the point that we need social tipping points in order to rapidly move towards our current business as usual state into a decarbonized state. And as you can see from this slide, depending on the social complexities, that transition may be smooth, but most likely it won't be smooth. There'll be lots of perturbations. Uh, there may be improvements and then setbacks and so on um, uh, as a result of um, climate change opposition, climate change denial, lack of governance that Chris has talked about, lack of good governance. So this, um, concept of social tipping points, I believe, is a very useful one. Of course, I'm aware that there's a lot of debate about it, the importance of good and rigorous definitions and so on, but nevertheless, I think a very useful concept. So how can consideration of health support progress towards social tipping points? And just briefly want to raise the question of, does knowledge of health threats of climate change contribute to the social change necessary for climate action? I think the answer to that is possibly. Does the knowledge of health co-benefits of climate change mitigation accelerate climate action? And I think, the, again, the answer to that is possibly. We don't have the full um, evidence for that at the moment, but I think it's a very plausible hypothesis. And remember that climate action doesn't just reduce the risks of dangerous climate change. It also brings near-term benefits from the reduction of air pollution, more sustainable diets, more sustainable transport systems, and so on. And then on the negative side, very briefly, to mention, do potential trade-offs and spillovers of badly designed climate policies reduce the chances of um, rapid climate action? So, as I've said, the evidence is not entirely clear, but there's a recent study here just published looking um, at uh, conjoint experiments in over 7,000 adults in five countries, shown here. And what this study found was that a positive framing both pos positive health and environmental framing of potential climate solutions bolsters, increases the public support for active climate policies, climate change mitigations, and even amongst in individuals that are relatively unconcerned about climate change, emphasizing positive messages and the health benefits of action increases the likelihood of support for climate policies. So there is at least this emerging evidence that uh, climate framing 
and positive framing may be beneficial in accelerating change. And in our Pathfinder initiative that Tallulah mentioned briefly in her introduction, we are seeking to collect the evidence, not just about the magnitude of healthcare benefits from modeling studies, but also about what happens when you try to implement some of those changes. And I would say that we found a lot of evidence from modeling, but not as much evidence as we hope from implemented studies. So we need a lot more evidence of what happens when you actually try to accelerate change um, on the ground and evaluate the climate change, the greenhouse gas benefits, but also um, the health benefits. But this slide is just an example of one of those modeling studies from Ian Hamilton and, and colleagues. Um, and it uh, estimates the public health uh, benefits or the co-benefits really of achieving the Paris Agreement. Just focusing on nine countries, you can see by 2040 ambitions, ambitious um, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement that put health at the center of these climate policies to meet the well below two degree goals of the Paris Agreement could reduce annual deaths due to air pollution by over one and a half million, something of that order, annual deaths by due to diet related risk factors by promoting uh, lower meat, lower red meat consumption, higher fruit and vegetables, for example, could potentially reduce annual deaths by over six million, and increase physical activity, promoting sustainable transport by perhaps um, over, over 2 million. So these are big benefits uh, based on only nine countries. And you can see how they vary according to the country, according to the dietary patterns, physical activity patterns, and air pollution exposures. But they're big benefits. And other studies have also shown big benefits from climate mitigation. So using these benefits to lever policy change uh, could, we believe, help to accelerate um, these transitions. So health care benefits, a greater knowledge and awareness of health care benefits, and indeed the economic benefits arising from them, if you value those health care benefits uh, using economic valuation, could help to create the ennobling conditions for change, but perhaps, uh, perhaps in some cases also trigger positive tipping uh, as populations become more aware of the near term um, health benefits of action. And this uh, uh, nice model from Rich Carmichael shows us how health co-benefits can help lever policy change. So he suggests that um, through social contagion, behaviors passing from one person to another, shifting norms and value systems, we could accelerate progress through these uh, tipping points, that uh, market and industry responses can also help to accelerate change by creating more sustainable products that populations take up, that the co-benefits can help filter through to policy change and influence climate policy, that uh, these supporting of a, a fairer, uh, more uh, open and conducive, a leadership conducive to rapid climate change can help to create a virtuous cycle and support behavior change and public uh, engagement. So if we can get these processes right, then there's this potential for positive feedback loops, which of course is one of the characteristics of social tipping points. So could the quest for improved air quality, for example, accelerate progress towards a net zero tipping point? I believe it could. And there's increased evidence that it's very important because we know now that air pollution has no safe level. WHO air quality guidelines are lower than they were 15 years ago. And we know that even levels as low as five micrograms per cubic meter can have health implications. Um, and so we need to accelerate progress towards the phasing out of fossil fuels and other um, human cause causes of, of um, fine particles uh, and greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So there's a lot that can be done to improve health through reduced air pollution and also to reduce the risk of climate change. Climate change. This paper is taken from a very recent publication just a, a few weeks ago, really. I'm still sort of digesting the implications of it, but I thought it was quite interesting because it, it tries to summarize the evidence through a meta-analysis of what we need to do to shift towards healthier and potentially low carbon transport strategies, particularly in urban centers. And it compares what they call carrots, in other words, actions and interventions that can incentivize change by providing benefits and sticks, in other words, interventions that can actually um, prevent people doing harmful things like using their car too much in cities, um, but also um, can, can accelerate progress towards a more sustainable and low carbon transport system. And what they showed was, particularly when it comes to active travel, walking and cycling, probably a combination of carrots and sticks, making uh, walking and cycling safer, for example, 
preventing people through congestion charging or other mechanisms from using their cars, private cars in city centres, could help to accelerate the change towards more sustainable transport systems, less dependent on the private car in urban centres, of course. Um, this could help to accelerate change and bring about uh, improvements in health. And then in terms of diets, um, there is this recent um, a study done by some of my colleagues based on UK uh, dietary intake data showing that there is now an increased consumption of plant-based alternative foods and of course not all of these foods are necessarily beneficial for health we know that some of these plant-based foods are very heavy in, in, in sodium and in saturated fat but many of them are beneficial and overall it's pushing us in the right direction and you can see that there has been an increased consumption even without government policies to support it we know that Women, millennials, high income households um, are likely to be consuming the highest amounts of these plant based foods. Um, and uh, this suggests that population change is possible over time. But what we need to guard against is increasing inequities in access to healthy and sustainable diets. But it does seem like the information, the evidence is percolating through um, to the general public. And then the healthcare system itself. So we're increasingly understanding that the healthcare system is an important source of greenhouse gases. I mean, it's a paradox, really, that the system set up to preserve and protect and improve our health and treat us when we get ill also contributes to climate change and to environmental impacts and air pollution being, being another one. And you can see from the National Health Service in England where those emissions come from, a scope one from anaesthetic agents, from fossil fuels burnt on site of hospital facilities, Scope two, electricity, and scope three, which is the lion's share really of the emissions, about 60% or so from medicines, a lot of embedded carbon there, food and catering, business services, business travel, um, and manufacturing of the products used in healthcare. And on the right, you can see how that divides up. So increasingly, there's a lot of in interest in the healthcare system, how, how the health um, care system can help to um, stimulate progress can perhaps trigger social tipping points and we've seen already 59 countries committed to building low carbon climate resilient health systems which chris mentioned the importance of those and some of those about 14 have set a deadline of 2050 or earlier by which their health systems uh, will achieve net zero and that means working not just with the health professionals but also with the industries that provide the products that healthcare systems use and increasingly, for example, NHS England is saying it will only um, uh, procure those products from, from those, um, those companies that are able to decarbonize their own supply chains. But just to end perhaps on a cautionary note, of course, um, policies need to be well designed. And if you have badly designed policies, uh, then you could actually impede progress towards a net zero carbon uh, uh, health, um, healthy uh, economy. And this is just one example. And so it's a nice systematic review done by Muscat and colleagues, which is called The Battle for Biomass. I like the title. And it's about the potential contribution, um, competition between food on the one hand, feed for animals and fuel for biofuels. And they make the important point that we have to make the right policy decisions. So we have to prioritize food availability and perhaps secondly feed and not overemphasize biofuels because that may take away, depending on which biofuel you use, uh, the potential for um, growing enough food to provide uh, food security for a growing world population in the face of climate change, particularly when you have increasing um, food prices. So getting those um, decisions right is gonna be important in terms of accelerating uh, the kind of change that we all want to see. So in conclusion, um, I conclude that there will be health consequences of exceeding climate tipping points, and some of those are probably already occurring, others may be in the pipeline. There will also be climate change tipping points for health, particularly in very vulnerable populations, such as the ones I've, I've described, from gradually shifting trends in climate, as well as um, those uh, sudden shifts in climate, the climate tipping points that I've mentioned. There may be unexpected health impacts, nasty surprises ahead, and interactions with other environmental fa uh, factors may also result in tipping points at an earlier stage that would have occurred if these had been functioning in isolation. On the positive side, I suggested that social tipping points are a useful 
um, concept, providing we define them in the right way and in a rigorous way, and that increasing reg recognition of the health care benefits of climate change mitigation could help to achieve these social tipping points. But poorly designed policies could result in trade-offs that impede progress. Of course, as a researcher, I would say evaluation of implemented actions is essential to, to accelerate progress, because it's undoubtedly true that we are seeing an increasing amount of greenwash, uh, because there is an imperative, obviously, to make change. And many, many policymakers um, are now sometimes making unfounded claims about the impacts of their policies. So governance, evaluation, accountability is going to be crucial. So um, I'll leave it there, Tallulah, and uh, I'm sure we're happy to uh, participate in discussion. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, um, Andy. That was a really excellent expose and lots of lots of food for thought. And I want to, we've got a couple of questions and I'm just going to give people a chance to type their questions in. <clears throat> I'm going to start with just the last um, few words that you mentioned, Andy, which was on um, governance. I'd love to hear your reflections and and you too, Chris, as well, come in here on on the, uh, the current state of a governance for health um, to tackle these these complex and in, interweaving uh, challenges. What are your reflections on are we fit for purpose purpose at the moment? <laughs> um, just to be a little bit provocative and um, and or what do you what ingredients do you think would be necessary? Um, in, in thinking about our more global governance structures to, to in, ensure we are better fit for purpose. Well, uh, I don't know whether Chris wants to start. Well, should I kick off then, Chris? You start, Andy. I think, I think we'll probably say <laughs> the same thing. But no, I mean, I think, you know, also from what Chris said, I mean, the government system, governance systems aren't really fit for purpose at the present time. I mean, not only because... Um, the metrics of governance, as, as Chris so eloquently explained, you know, don't give us a very good relationship. They don't show us a strong relationship between the metrics of climate resilience and what actually happens on the ground. And that we found that with COVID. I think we're going to find it with climate change as well. Also, we know that um, the healthcare system is often rather divorced you know, from the broader um, governance around climate change and so on. You know, COP27. OK, health was there, COP26, health was there, but it wasn't um, wasn't really central to the whole debate. In fact, health was rather marginally mentioned in the final documentation. And we know that um, not enough money is going into climate change adaptation and mitigation for health. Uh, so for a whole range of reasons, both, uh, I would say, kind of maladapted governance, but also inadequate resources, um, the current system is, is not fit for purpose and, and cannot take us safely through the coming decades, I, I fear. But Chris, let me pass over to you. No, absolutely. It's not fit for purpose. And I'll add other dimensions to that. When we think about some of the major advances in environmental health, uh, lead and gasoline, for example, getting the lead out of gasoline, lead and uh, lead paint, tobacco smoking, what health has primarily done is do a series of studies, work out exposure response relationships, come up with a, a central estimate and apply that everywhere. And that does not work. That what we have right now just does not work in a changing climate. There's implicit assumptions in all of our policies and programs that the population, that everything's gonna stay the change, everything's gonna stay the same. The only thing that's gonna change is my little variable I'm looking at. Yeah. And of course, everything is changing. And to think about, as Andy said, we have to have mechanisms at the national level where all of the ministries collaborate, where there's easy access to the weather data, where you've got ways to work very closely across the other sectors. Andy talked about some of the maladaptation that's possible with biofuels. And those trade-offs have to be understood there's a question somewhere about what kind of research needs. One of them is on trade-offs, mm -hmm. that health has not really worked on what kinds of trade-offs that we're facing and making sure that health is central to those discussions of the trade-offs. And I could go on. I think if we held this seminar in 20 years from now, our health systems would look completely different. 
because they're not fit for purpose for climate change. They're not fit for mm. purpose for poverty, for mm. equity, a whole range of issues that our societies are grappling with. And mm. we have to shift to be mm. able to be more effective. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think one of the one of the questions I think picks up on this point of uh, of the trade-offs and, and on the issue of heat. Um, or, or highlights the importance of this kind of more systems approach. So um, Gabby um, Hegel, so apologies if I didn't do that right, um, uh, asked about the dangers of extreme heat, um, because Chris, on one hand, you mentioned the uh, dangers of vector-borne diseases, and Andy mentioned um, the actual habit habitability um, of places due to heat. So I think maybe this is what this is part of the question. Do, do either of you want to, to expand on that? Yeah, thanks, Gabby. It's a, it's a great question. And I'll start with a perspective from my side is humans live in all kinds of places that frankly are not very habitable, that humans are hugely adaptable. And the questions are whether it's possible to continue to adapt. And so the projections that Andy showed really didn't take into account the complexity of our individual societal responses to heat. And thinking about the risks in the future, I think it's important that we separate out places where it'll, it'll be possible to survive. It may mean that we're going to do more activities at night. It may mean different infrastructure we can survive versus places where we can't actually live. And we don't really have the understanding of what are gonna be the constraints. Water is going to be a major constraint. I don't know how we can get around water. I think there's ways we can get around some of the high temperatures, but that is really gonna depend on creativity in terms of technology development, in, in terms of air conditioning. I know there's lots of high energy efficient air conditioning that's on its way out an area where there's a whole lot of work that does need to be done to be able to sort through those complex questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with Chris. I mean, obviously, people are resilient. Societies can be resilient, but there will be limits to adaptation. Yeah. Uh, and we don't fully understand where they are. I mean, clearly, if you put enough resources in it, if you can put people on the moon, you can probably, you know, you could physically live in some of these areas, but that's not the point. The point is, you know, could you actually have a functioning society in those areas? Uh, so I think that is a concern. And I fear that we may be getting close, very close to the limits in some parts of the world, particularly where which are very resource constrained. Um, so uh, what I would say is that... Um, we need to also tap into other sources of knowledge. And one of those sources might be indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's been an uneasy relationship between Western science and indigenous knowledge, but I think increasingly we're seeing the great virtues of it. Of course, what I would say also is that the, the, the traditional knowledge is, well, we're now moving out, out of the comfort zone, if you like, where a lot of that traditional knowledge was formed. But it doesn't mean to say it's irrelevant because indigenous knowledge can also help us in, actually um, understanding how to uh, be resilient in the face of, of extreme uh, extreme events and so on. So we need to mobilize all the resources we can get, not just Western scientific knowledge, but also indigenous knowledge. We need to co-design and co-develop solutions. So for example, if you're talking to um, subsistence farmers, you know, it's no good going in and saying, well, I, I know how you can adapt, you know, do this, that, and the other. You've got to actually talk to them about what they think is feasible within their day-to-day -day life. How much could they change their routine? Is it safe to mm. go out to the fields at nighttime, for example, particularly for women? That's a big, big issue. So I think it really raises the importance of co-design, of consultation, not imposing solutions on people, but listening to what they've got to say and then trying to de devise the best available solution. And then, of course, evaluating it to see whether it has a desired effect. And that's going to be such an important issue for, for research um, over the over, over coming uh, decades. Mm -hmm. Is that distinction yeah, between what is possible and one, one oh, quick please. point um, yeah, please. based on Gabby's question, it's not either or with heat or vector-borne diseases. No, it's no. all of the above. It's all of them. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. And it's yeah, no, no, definitely. I was just saying, I was just going to say is the is the distinction between what is theoretically possible and what we can actually 
what we would actually would actually do. And I think Victor's Victor Brofkin has got a follow on um, question uh, to Andy, mm -hmm. which is a similar question again. This understanding the different different moving parts. So he's interested in particularly the health impact of permafrost and your perspective on whether most of this health risks is would be likely to come from um, pathogens and pollutants that emerge or from the, the stress associated with yeah. changing lifestyles. Uh, I think it's the same answer that Chris just gave, both probably. Uh, uh, I mean, I think there are dangers from pathogens, real dangers. Um, it isn't just this exotic uh, pathogens. You're also seeing, for example, increases in diarrheal diseases uh, and so on in some of the Arctic communities um, <clears throat> as a result of, you know, contamination of fresh water and so on. Um, uh, but it's also because of you're seeing population displacement in some of these communities. Some are being forced to move because they're, they're no longer stable. Their community is no longer stable. The ice is melting, so they have to move away. And that's causing not just physical health problems, but also mental health problems. I didn't really have time to discuss this concept of solastalgia, but it, it's the it's the distress caused by environmental change. When people see the environment actually changing almost in front of their eyes, you know, that is a very, very distressing thing to witness. And, and it's being documented in the people in the Arctic, but also in other parts of the world, in Australia and other parts of the world as well. So I think it's a combination, uh, to be honest. It, it's um, and it's physical and it's mental. Um, and, and we don't fully know there may be some, as I say, nasty surprises, of disease we haven't thought about or we thought we'd seen the end of, which, which come back to haunt us. So it's a very dynamic mm -hmm. area and it's mm -hmm. a, certainly an area where we need more uh, more research and well, action. If I add a perspective on the solastasia. It's something I haven't seen written about that, frankly, I think should be written about, is when you look at the temperature curves, the observed temperature curves, there was a, a shift in the slope in somewhere in the 1980s, the good old hockey stick. Another way to think about that is to turn that around and say that anyone born after some time in the 1980s mm -hmm. has never seen a stable climate. Yeah, yeah. I talk about this with my kids. It's uh, we, In health, we talk about cohorts. It's a massive cohort effect that they, they just don't understand how one like me can have an internal set point of, yes, the weather is weird, but I have a sense of what normal used to look like. Of course, what I think normal used to look like also is becoming increasingly at variance with the reality. They've never seen normal. And so they don't have that sense of stability around the weather that people born before the 1980s have. And I think this into some of the mental health issues because it gives them just a fundamental sense of unease as they're continuing to watch climate change, as, as they're watching all of the yeah. dramatic events we're seeing around the world and have yeah. a different feeling about it than adults have, older mm -hmm. adults. I want, to, I want to pick up on that point, Chris, um, of, of uncertainty and unease because Sharik um, Hussein had a, a question about this around um, the notion of uncertainty in the context of these kind of highly um, interconnected systems and linking that back to the earlier questions we we, we spoke about in governance um, and and how some of our policies and, and governance structures are not um, maybe best set up to deal with uncertainties, you know, constantly trying to resolve back to certainty and what happens when when that doesn't but that doesn't um, come. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and particularly whether you have any examples of any um, policy approaches or governance approaches that have, in your opinion, successfully dealt with or embraced that uncertainty. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. This is a topic that comes up regularly that the scientists focus on all the time. When I give public talks and this comes up, question I ask the public is how many of you know when your next auto accident is going to be? How many of you have auto insurance? It's, it's a false problem. We take decisions under uncertainty all the time. Decision makers take decisions under uncertainty all the time. A more important point to make, and Andy made it just extremely well, the transition's already underway and to focus on all the change that we're already seeing, very positive change that we're seeing, so that we can facilitate that and accelerate it. The example I use a lot recently is I, I went grocery shopping. 
And I'm walking back to my car in an underground parking garage, carrying my groceries. And I swore I heard wind chimes. I started calculating the distance to the exit. I started thinking about everything around the exit to that grocery store, trying to figure out how in the world I could hear wind chimes. It obviously took me a while to figure this out. I did not hear a single internal combustion engine. It was all electric vehicles. They all make little noises at low speed and they all make different noises. And my brain went, wind chimes, right? Little tinkling noises. And it was a remarkable moment for me of, this is what children are gonna be growing up with. Underground parking garages are not gonna be stinky, smelly things. They're not gonna be noisy. They're just gonna go down there and hear basically wind chimes with cleaner air. We're, we're seeing so much change and to focus on the positive of we have huge risks, we're starting to address them, inadequate, we need to do more, and we're already on the path. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, you know, we, we, many of these uh, solutions, the potential solutions are kind of win-win solutions, you know, because they're, as, as Chris has said, you know, they're beneficial anyway. <laughs> and so we would want to go in that direction. I mean, I would argue that we should be focusing more on public transport, active travel and so on. But, you know, where you have to use a car, then, yeah, it should be a, an electric one. So um, so many of these changes are, are good for us in any event. What we need to do is to rapidly scale up, you know, to scale up by a factor of whatever, 10 or something, the, the speed of, 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 of movement. And the problem is at the moment we have an economy which where we don't pay the full ex cost of all the externalities, you know. So... Um, uh, you know, we've got a situation where it might cost you 10 times as much to go on a train to somewhere in Europe as it would to fly. I mean, that's madness. But that's because we're not paying the full economic cost when we get on a plane. We're not paying all the cost of that CO2 and, you know, the pollutants emitted around the airport and all that stuff. So, you know, we've got to stop that. And um, uh, we've got to make the, the, the right choice, the sustainable and healthy choice, the easy choice. And that's something that policymakers really need to get a grip on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's lots that can be done. It's a, it could be made into a good news story, not just a good doom and gloom story. But at the moment, policymakers aren't prepared to fa face the fact that they'll have to confront some powerful vested interests. You know, the airlines will make a lot of noise, you know. So, OK, fine. <laughs> you know, we're pretty used to that in public health. The, you know, the tobacco community <laughs> didn't like us too much. <laughs> You've got to be and, a bit and not, and not just not so just you're not tinkling doing the job properly. <laughs> not not just wind time wind time tinkling noises either. They would have there will be some you know there will be some confrontations. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I think the other thing is we need to, to to celebrate the change that is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. Mm, and mm. I was very disappointed. There was so little publicity around the fact that all major automotive manufacturers have given a date when they're out of internal combustion engines. Mm -hmm. In high income countries, more of our emissions come from transport than anything else. This is absolutely huge. And mm -hmm. it just sort of was a little line in passing, right? It was like, you don't understand how important this is. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there are industries, there are businesses that will complain, but there's businesses that are seeing the opportunities of the future and are investing in the new technologies, are investing in change, and we need to support them as well by pointing mm. out the good that they're doing, and that will help accelerate. Yeah, yeah. I want to um, pick up on this point and go to the the social, right? So, because um, uh, Andy ended with the thing, talk about the social tipping points, which I thought was really fascinating. And that picks up on, um, on Heinz Fusig's question, or comment around um, the the importance of of the of value system in a sense. So he asks about well, what about a, a more sharing and more caring economy as being really critical, um, or a more caring society as being really critical to this to this transition. And um, and so I want to come to that because I think that that ties in with your notion of, of, of the social tipping point. Um, uh, Chris, you just mentioned around the importance of, you know, some businesses embracing um, um, actually what is good for people and planet. Um, really critical to that as well, though, is our approach and the equity and justice dimension, because so we don't end up with a situation where, yes, we have renewables and we have clean energy, but it's still not equally accessible and we have all the, all the same clustering of 
of power and access issues as we as we previously had. So I think to tackle this, we have to get to the essence of, of, of society. Um, I wonder, uh, maybe Chris first, because I know you've got to go in a few minutes, if you just uh, reflect a little bit on that, because um, maybe bringing in some of the other conversations happening around participatory democracies, right? And thinking about how to, how to reimagine our entire governance structure. So we're not just talking about global health governance and we're not just talking about climate governance, but this is a societal structure. And there are these parallel conversations going around. Well, do these very centralized top-down only systems work or can we envisage a society where people are much more engaged, where we have a different notion of civic participation where even citizen science and and we have this kind of participatory approach to, that is part and parcel of the system i'm throwing a bunch of things at you because i want to i, I wondered what your perspective is because when we're talking about governance you know we we also default to talking about policies and talk about governance but governance is also us yeah. right and and and, and we're, we're part of the government so chris first maybe uh, it's a great set of very very complicated issues <laughs> Um, and I'm also smiling because I'm in a, in a country that's seen some challenges with democracy in and of itself. Um, hopefully the midterms put us back on a more positive path on our own democracy. There's been a lot of change. I'm a worried optimist in this space that look at the change. It was insufficient. Tens of millions of people died from COVID, but started discussions. COVID laid bare the inequities we knew already existed. And they laid bare in a way that the public could see them. And that has changed the discussion. And you can see it, at least in the US, in the news media, it continues to bring up the inequity issues on almost every topic that arises. Tomorrow, there's gonna be a release from the US Global Change Research Program it coordinates the 13 federal agencies that conduct research on all of the global environmental change, focusing a lot on climate change. They're required by law to have a decadal research strategy that will be released tomorrow. And it very much takes a systems-based approach and very much looks at co-production. And so that is the plan for the research investments for the next decade, moving squarely into the space recognizing that we can't solve the problem of food insecurity by looking only at agricultural yields. We have to look at the complexity of our societies and we have to do it in a way that engages the stakeholders. And only by doing that will we be effective in reducing the risks and promoting human health and well-being. So again, worried optimist, but we're, we're making some strides and again, a lot further to go. Yeah, I, I would probably describe myself as someone who has hope, but maybe not as much optimism as Chris. <laughs> I think there's a difference between hope and optimism. You know, optimism is expectations all going to work out fine, which it may do, let's hope it does. The hope is that, yeah, it's, it's still possible for it to work out fine. And I think it is really. I think it's, you know, we know broadly what we have to do. There are still some uncertainties, but we know broadly. We know broadly we're not doing it fast enough. Uh, and I do think it is a crisis of values, uh, values of society, and of course, a crisis of representation and democracy. And we're seeing, you know, how repressive countries are really falling apart, and but also the challenges of democracy in our own countries, and, and, and the UK has had it too. So um, it's very, populism, I think, is, is based on inequalities. I mean, it's very much fed by inequalities. And when you get that kind of resentment, it's easy to stir up. Um, populism in, in a society and distract us from the things that we really need to do. So we uh, inequalities are, are crucial, inequalities in emissions, historic emissions, uh, but also um, inequities in access to, uh, you know, crucial resources and, and education and health and so on have to be dealt with. So we have to think of policies that will integrate um, and optimise the challenge of reducing inequity uh, with moving towards a, a net zero carbon economy, emphasizing, I think, the positive benefits of, of doing so. 
that seems to me the big challenge at the moment. I don't quite see any policymakers around the world really making that case, although there are some governments that are moving towards the well-being economy, which I think is a, is a nice approach. Um, and we should certainly support those that want to move down that road, because I think that is a way forward in, in terms of ensuring we have a society which promotes health and equity within planetary boundaries. And that seems to me the right kind of direction of travel. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a plug in. There's a paper coming out, I think, today on nature positive and people positive. Mm -hmm. David Obura uh, is the lead author, and it's part of the Earth Commission that's doing okay. exactly what Andy's talking about, is looking at pathways to transformation that are both positive for the planet and positive for all people, and mm -hmm. particularly addressing the inequities. Okay. I'm sure Caroline's going to put some things in the yeah, chat about the Yeah, I've got, yeah, got it in the chat. And um, and Andy, you mentioned about um, governments doing um, some of this this necessary work. I, I just want to highlight here as well the different levels of government because I mean, in my experience, also there's quite a lot more perhaps experimental and transformative work happening subnationally. Yeah. Um, at the city level with um, city level governments actually taking very bold actions yeah. um, to, to tackle some of these. And perhaps some of the challenges might be that we have a governance structures that speak to national um, and kind of maybe don't um, uh, recognize uh, yeah. the subnational as much as, as perhaps they should. Um, so you mentioned, uh, sorry, Andy, did you want to? No, no, just as I was going to agree with you and say, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot more excitement and energy at the subnational level. Mm. But of course, uh, you, you can't uh, avoid the national because the national can set the mm. framing. They, they can bring in things like, you know, carbon pricing regulation and so on. Uh, so Absolutely. ideally, we need synergies between the two. But um, mm -hmm. certainly the subnational is a more active and vibrant environment with which to work uh, at the moment and more the decision makers of course closer to the to the public closer to the voters and have a much better appreciation of what what goes well with them hmm. yeah absolutely okay we've got one more question uh, to round off with um uh and chris i will come to you hopefully we'll get you in there because you both mentioned um you mentioned optimism chris and and andy you mentioned hope um I've heard it say that hope is evidence-informed optimism, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so as, as people who are in the evidence business um, of knowledge generation, what is the one thing that you say, this is a question from Angelique uh, Mavradaris, to say, what is the one thing that you think researchers, people in, who are generating this evidence can do or should do to affect this kind of change and you know, the fundamental kind of power and governance structure. What is the one thing that you think we should do to to shift us from to to the both oh, optimism, both sides of the equation are are true, Chris? That's actually a complicated question because most of us operate on the uh, assumption that it's the absence of knowledge that keeps people from action, taking action, and that deficit model doesn't really reflect most of people's opinions, most of people's actions. Certainly framing in the way that Andy did, we're definitely facing real significant risks. And we've got real significant opportunities in making sure that we are balanced and provide people with the assessment of the risks, the assessment of the possibilities, and make sure that each individual sees where they could start engaging so that this is a collective effort moving forward and not just a few. Thank you. Uh, very much agree with Chris, who I know has to leave in probably now. <laughs> so I'll say goodbye. But uh, just to say that I, I think increasingly evaluating the impacts, you know, researchers need to be not just, I mean, models are great, you know, they give us an idea of what can be achieved, but we actually need now to not delay action, waiting for the best available evidence, but act. And as we're acting, we need evaluation. And that means that the research community has got to be involved working with policymakers to provide an independent benchmark uh, to really just to measure our progress, also to understand where we're not progressing. And I do worry about the pressure for or greenwash and the fact that everyone's saying they're doing wonderful things when we know it can't be like that because things aren't happening at the speed that we know they have to happen. So not everything that people say they're doing 
is actually being achieved. And I'm afraid we really need to be very clear with people when that happens mm -hmm. and not necessarily phrase it in a negative way, but say, look, if you really want to have an impact, you need to do this. You know, you need to accelerate mm -hmm. your ambition you need to uh, take a different tack. And so I think that acting as a kind of um, honest broker, an honest evaluator, an independent evaluator is really going to be important um, as we move forward in order to provide a kind of beacon or a, a guide to, to how we need to, to act and whether we're actually achieving what we all uh, want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And really important to see the different partners and collaborators we need to have on this journey, right? Because sometimes yeah. uh, researchers, we think we, we're going to work away by ourselves and then pop yeah, up yeah, and exactly. let the world know. With, so who do you think are the kinds of people who are the kinds of people that you've been working with or that you think would be really critical to engage on this on this journey for anyone kind of listening to this? Well, increasingly, of course, we're reconceptualizing how I mean health healthcare systems, as Chris said, is very, are very important. But look, health isn't just about health care. Um, you know, I, I would say to the average minister of, the, of energy or housing or transport, you are a health minister, whether you mm -hmm. like it or not. And mm -hmm. so you, the, the actions you're going to take are going to have massive impacts on, on human health. And I think... <laughs> Really, one of the issues is we have to work with people outside our comfort zone in health. We have to work with people in different sectors because mm -hmm. those determinants are so important for health. And we have to bring together different disciplines because, you know, the traditional public health disciplines are great, but they're not sufficient really to answer some mm -hmm. of these complex problems. So increasingly, we're working in a transdisciplinary environment, collaborating with a whole range of different scientists, not just climate scientists, agricultural scientists, social scientists, of course. And as well as uh, engaging with this idea of citizen science, which, is, as we've heard, is, is an important um, concept mm -hmm. as well. So it is a very different landscape to the conventional yeah. science landscape. The problem is, are the science funders on board? Uh, mm. and I've got a meeting really? with them come tomorrow. <laughs> it's very interesting to see how they respond to this. But, um, you know, not, not yeah. to argue for my own research, but to argue more generally for you know, a cha yeah. change in the way in which research is funding. So, you know, that, right. that, that's going to be really interesting. I think they're beginning mm -hmm. to see the issues, but mm -hmm. can we reform the way in which the science community works and break mm -hmm. down these disciplinary and, and uh, sectoral silos? I think that's a crucial issue. And thinking in systems, way, yeah. that's, that's going to be so crucial for the future. Absolutely, because we know we we can't we try to do this work, but we also need the the incentives uh, structures aligned as well. Exactly. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Chris and thank you to Andy. Um, please join me uh, in giving a virtual round of applause uh, to our speakers for those excellent, really excellent talks and discussions. And to you, uh, the, uh, the participants, for those questions and comments that you had today. Thank you for staying, staying with us for the duration. Uh, just to mention now that the uh, discussion series, the Tipping Points discussion series will be taking a break, um, but there are plans already for events on coral reefs and cloud feedback and atmospheric interactions um, in, in the next year. So uh, the new events for 2023 will be announced on the website, which was shared on the chat soon. So do see that link. Um, and then just to point out that um, there uh, is a project on designing joint experiments and ideas for tipping, a tipping elements model into comparison project or tip MIP. Uh, so if you'd like to get involved in that, then do fill out a, an expression of interest form which can also be found in, in the chat, I am assured. So thank, with that, thank you all very much. We are right on the, right on the hour. Um, have a good rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you. And thank you to the organizers. Thanks. Take care. Bye.